at the Grand The Grand Rounds are an opportunity um, for the Health Department to build on the competencies of the public health um, core services. And today, uh, we're going to build on the core competency uh, related to providing essential services uh, for in, uh, informing and empowering people about important health issues. So today, um, our topic is improving care uh, for those with asthma and obesity. Obes um, asthma um, in Vermont is a, an important issue. Twelve percent of adults have asthma, and Vermont is the fifth highest has the fifth highest rate of asthma in the nation. Our mortality rate is twice the national average. Poorly managed asthma results in decreased quality of life missed uh, work and school days, and um, also is a cause of preventable emergency room and hospital stays. Asthma is often exacerbated by environmental factors and indoor triggers, including tobacco smoke, but it's also related to lifestyle factors, including obesity, nutrition, and lack of physical uh, activity which is an area of expertise for uh, Dr. Ann Dixon. And she's here today to uh, share her expertise in that. So I'm really pleased on behalf of the um, asthma team and the physical activity and nutrition program to introduce Ann, uh, who is the director of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine and professor of medicine at the University of Vermont. She's originally from England, and you're going to enjoy, um, I, I think, uh, listening to her speak today. She moved to the United States after completing medical school at Oxford University. She completed her residency training at John Hopkins and joined the faculty at the University of Vermont in 2001. Her research career has focused on clinical and translational studies in human asthma. Her research group has been particularly focused on understanding the mechanisms of linking obesity and asthma. She's published numerous on this topic and was the lead editor of the first book published on obesity and lung disease, and also is the lead author on the American Thoracic Society's statement on obesity, obesity and asthma. So, Anne, thank you. Um, we're going to uh, hold questions until the end and then have time for dialogue. But please, for those joining, especially by phone, to mute your, your phones by using star six. Um, and you can uh, let us know if you have any, uh, any concerns using Skype by using the, the chat feature. You can also use that to ask questions. So thanks for joining us, and Anne, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, um, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this today. I think this is a really important topic and uh, relatively underappreciated. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is the epidemiology linking uh, BMI obesity um, with severe asthma um, and talk to you about how I think approaching uh, patients who are struggling with these comorbidities. Because I think it affects everything. It affects response to medications. Um, it affects response to environmental factors. Uh, it increases susceptibility to infections. Uh, patients often have multiple comorbidities that are making their asthma difficult to imagine, to manage. Um, we need to think about um, lifestyle considerations. Um, and actually, maybe in some of these patients, um, I think about bariatric surgery, which is a pretty radical solution for treating asthma. And so, um, I, probably for this group, I don't need to introduce the uh, epidemiology of the obesity epidemic. This is data from the World Health Organization, actually nearly 10 years old right now, um, looking at the prevalence of obesity uh, in uh, males over the age of 15 on the top and females um, over the age of 15 on the, on the bottom. And the prevalence of obesity is greater than 30% in, in, in the dark red. And you can see, um, yes, there's a high prevalence in the United States, but, but it is not isolated to the United States. In fact, I hate to tell you, but the United States is not even in the lead. Um, there are countries sort of in the Middle East and, and uh, the Pacific Ocean with much higher prevalence of obesity than the United States, and Europe is doing its best to catch up. Um, so this is really a worldwide problem. 
And so what does this mean in, 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 in terms of asthma? Um, well, the, the prevalence of asthma in adults for years has been sort of quoted as sort of um, 6 to 8%. Yes, we have a higher prevalence um, in, uh, in Vermont. Um, is there, I don't know if there's a pointer here. Uh, but this uh, is looking at current asthma prevalence. This is data from the CDC that was published back in 2016. So prevalence is here on the y-axis. And the first three set of figures um, that you see um, is that the adult population, the prevalence of asthma in those with a BMI of 18.5 to 25 to 7.1. Uh, so about the prevalence that we say it is uh, overweight a little higher. But in patients with a BMI of 30 or above, uh, the prevalence of asthma is 11%. So much higher. And this is a much more marked relationship for women. So that's the last three columns. So the prevalence of asthma in women with BMI 30 or greater is 15%. Um, so incredibly high. Um, and actually, uh, this, if you look at patients who have a really high BMI, um, there's a very high prevalence of asthma. So this is data that was from an NIH-sponsored consortium of, of bariatric surgery. Um, and they took, you know, two and a half thousand patients and they looked at the prevalence of various comorbidities and those with a BMI of 40 to 50, 50 to 60, and greater than 60. And they saw the comorbidities we think about, right? Hypertension, diabetes, uh, sleep apnea. And what was very surprising to them, I know because I, I know they commented to me about this, was the incredibly high prevalence of asthma. Um, so if your BMI is 40 to 50, the prevalence of asthma is 21%. By the time you get up to a BMI of 60 and above, uh, nearly a third of those patients um, report asthma. Um, so there is a dose-dependent relationship as well. So the heavier you are, the more likely you are to have asthma. This is particularly true in women. And when we look at patients' populations with severe asthma um, in the United States, there have been a number of studies that specifically focused on severe asthma. Nearly 60% of them are suffering with obesity. Uh, so this is really changing the demographics of the severe asthma population in the United States. And to think about, you know, managing these patients, um, it always helps to me to sort of, you know, take a patient. And I want to just walk you through um, my approach to asthma in a patient who's also suffering with obesity. And this, this is a, a real patient of mine. Uh, came in a few years ago. A uh, 39-year-old woman, no history of asthma or allergies as a child. She had adult-onset asthma. Um, about a 12-pack year smoking history. She had quit six years ago. Uh, and she was admitted to our ICU at UVM Medical Center on multiple occasions. In fact, in the year before I saw her, she'd been admitted six times to our ICU. Um, and the usual triggers for it were a respiratory tract infection. She had young kids. What do young kids do? They bring home respiratory tract infections. And every time she got a chest infection, it seemed she ended up in the ICU. And another thing that really seemed to bother her was um, they used um, the wood um, to heat, um, and the wood smoke uh, really bothered her asthma as well. She suffered with various comorbidities. She had gastroesophageal reflux disease, depression, hypertension, low back pain, and she, and she was on our usual mishmash of medications for patients with severe asthma. High-dose inhaled corticosteroid long-acting beta agonist, that's Advair, Spireva, an anticholinergic, um, as needed short-acting beta agonist, and she was almost continuously on prednisone. And what was the prednisone doing for her? She was gaining a huge amount of weight on the prednisone. It was just a complete disaster. And so, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about the medications in the management of obese asthma, because uh, this is actually one of the reasons I started working on this topic. Um, a few years ago now, we had done a study looking at low-dose theophylline, the oldest medication in the world to treat asthma. Um, and we had come up with a very interesting observation. Um, so this is data from that study done by the American Lung Association Airways Clinical Research Centers. And we had looked at exacerbation rates in patients who were assigned either to placebo or low-dose theophylline, 300 milligrams a day. And what you can see on the left-hand side of the graph um, is uh, what happened to uh, lean patients who were put on placebo or theophylline. And what you can see on the right hand of the graph is what happened to obese patients who were put on placebo and theophylline. So that it had a paradoxical effect. They actually had increased asthma exacerbation. Now, we weren't able to address the mechanisms in this study, uh, but theophylline can worsen gastroesophageal reflux disease. We were asking patients about gastroesophageal reflux disease. They, they didn't tell us they had more symptoms. 
uh, but actually theophylline can cause actually breakdown of fat cells. And so um, I've always wondered if, if that might have been part of the mechanism. It may have been having metabolic effects. Well, we don't use much theophylline, but what we do use these days is we use a lot of uh, inhaled corticosteroid long-acting beta agonists, the Advair, the Simbacort, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and about the same time, uh, there was data from Mark Petersgold, and that's the, the, the gray and black uh, graph here on the left. And uh, he looked at data um, from a uh, Merck database where they'd studied uh, Montelukast um, and compared it with an inhaled corticosteroid baclomethasone. And what you're looking there on the y-axis is asthma control day. So the higher you are on the y-axis, the better your asthma control. And so what they saw with Montelukast was pretty equivalent um, uh, effect efficacy um, of, of, of the Montelukast. But on the uh, second set of bars there, the black is the lean, uh, the dark gray is the overweight, and the light gray is the obese on inhaled corticosteroid. And so the obese patients uh, on the inhaled corticosteroid had lesser response. They did not respond as well. They had fewer asthma control days. And uh, another publication uh, came out shortly after looking at uh, salmeterol fluticasone combination versus fluticasone, and then actually the green bars combined in underweight, normal weight, overweight, obese class one, that's a BMI of 30 to 35, class two, above 35, class three, above uh, 40. And what you can see is there's a decrease uh, in the number of asthma control days in the patients that were assigned to these very effective medications if their BMI was elevated. So there's now a whole host of literature suggesting that these control agents don't work as well. Uh, there's been a lot of speculations about um, anticholinergics. We're using those increasingly these days in patients with asthma, and there was um, animal data suggesting that um, they may be more effective. Uh, we've recently published this, um, looking at improvement in lung function in patients um, on uh, uh, theotropium, which is sort of the black line against BMI, uh, increasing BMI, a little hard to see on the x-axis improvement in FEV1 lung function was maintained across BMI. This is not a patient-based outcome, so we don't have data on exacerbations or asthma control or asthma quality of life. Um, so not entirely sure, at least their lung function uh, improves equivalently. So these are the main medications we use. The other medications we're increasingly using in patients with severe asthma is we're using biologics, which work on allergic inflammation, eosinophilic inflammation, and there is not yet much data addressing this. There was a recent publication um, on anti-IgE therapy that did seem to be effective, but it has weight-based dosing and we can't use it in patients with higher BMI. Um, so we're just beginning to investigate whether biologics might be effective. But I can tell you biologics are incredibly expensive way to treat patients with asthma. Um, so what else do we need to be thinking about? Well, what was she telling us? Um, she was telling us that she, her triggers were upper respiratory tract infections um, and wood smoke. And so what have we learned about exposure to environmental pollutants um, in patients who are suffering with obesity and asthma? Well, a lot, actually. And one of the things is that common exposures increase your risk for developing both asthma and obesity. So if your parents smoke, we know that increases the risk of a child developing obese, uh, asthma, right? We've known that for a long time. We really try and encourage pregnant women to quit smoking. Um, and that causes a 1.3 to 1.6 fold risk of a child, the increased risk of a child having asthma. Did you know, I certainly didn't know, if your mother smoked, you also have an increased risk of developing obesity. So this same risk factor is leading to both asthma and obesity. And the other thing that's increasing literature on, we know air pollution um, is a risk factor for developing asthma in kids. A lot of literature on that. There's now increasing literature that actually air pollution increases your risk of developing obesity. Um, it was a recent publication that living close to a major roadway, independent of other socioeconomic factors, increase your risk of developing overall and abdominal obesity, so the worst form of obesity. So common risk factors lead to both asthma and obesity. That's a problem. The other thing is, um, 
um, in obese patients with asthma, they seem to have increased susceptibility to air pollution. And there's a couple of studies I'm showing here. This uh, uh, sort of cuboidal graph here, which I would find sort of difficult to, uh, to understand, but I'll try and talk you through it. This was from a study that was done by um, uh, uh, Kim Liu when she was working down at Hopkins and was within children. And so they recruited children with asthma and they recorded exposure to indoor particulate matter and they also recorded information about their asthma symptoms. And so what you can see than the lean kids. So the lean kids weren't symptomatic around the indoor uh, pollution. The kids who were suffering with obesity had a much higher rate of asthma symptoms if they were exposed to the indoor air pollution. Um, and there's a whole bunch of animal data that also supports this. The other piece of very interesting human data was published out of UNC where they took folks, um, actually this was all women, um, and they exposed them in a controlled way to uh, ozone. It was an ozone inhalational challenge. And they looked at decrease in lung function in response to the ozone. And you can see that the FEV1 forced excretory volume in one second, their forced vital capacity, decreased in both sets, but it decreased more in the women that were obese. Um, so there's increasing epidemiologic data and a ton of animal data in mass models to suggest that obesity actually increases airway responses to air pollution. The other thing that she told me was um, upper respiratory tract infections. I told you, kids kept bringing them home. She kept up and ending up in our ICU. And there is data to suggest that obesity also increases morbidity related to uh, respiratory tract infections. Uh, so this was uh, data that uh, we published out of the um, ALA ACRC network, and this included about actually a thousand kids, um, and it was a secondary analysis of uh, children and adults um, who were participating in asthma trials, and they were all keeping diary cards. And so we looked at their risk um, of uh, the dotted line here is the risk of one obesity. So we looked at children that had been developing respiratory tract infections, up or lower. When they got a respiratory tract infection, did they see steroids? Did they see health care? And overall, what was their risk? And, and it didn't make much difference in kids, actually. But if you look at an adult, what is really striking in the adults here is it's not that they had increased risk of developing respiratory tract infections, which is the top three um, uh, uh, dots there. But when they got a respiratory tract infection, they had about a 2.5-fold risk of needing corticosteroids, systemic corticosteroids, um, and nearly a doubling of the risk of having to see a healthcare provider when they got a respiratory tract infection. And overall, um, they also had more visits and more corticosteroid use. So their morbidity when they got a respiratory tract infection was much, much worse. Now, this is not widely appreciated, but we are just beginning to understand it. Back when we had the H1N1 epidemic, we saw that patients who were suffering with obesity had much higher morbidity related to influenza infection. And there was just a wonderful study that was uh, published recently by this woman, uh, Melinda Beck, who, who works down at UNC, who has done a lot of work looking at um, mechanisms by which um, obese mice have increased morbidity related to influenza. Well, I, I don't really care about obese mice, but she did this really <laughs> nice study um, sort of in a primary care population there. And what they did, she worked with this primary care practice and they immunized everybody um, for influenza. And then they followed them subsequently to see what was their risk of developing influenza infection. And they found um, that uh, patients whose BMI was 30 or above had a double the risk of developing influenza infection after vaccination compared with lean people. They were not responding as well to the influenza vaccine. Now, she looked at um, antibody titers, which were usually, antibody titers were, were, were similar, but when she looked at cell-based immune responses, 
the cell-based immune responses in the participants um, whose BMI was 30 and above was suppressed. Um, so we know they do work with influenza and they don't seem to respond quite as well to influenza vaccine, which really does give you pause to think. I don't know what to do with this information other than to be very careful um, and warn people who are suffering with obesity and asthma to be very careful if there's a, an influenza outbreak. So the other thing that um, uh, my patient was suffering was with comorbidity. She had gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, she suffered with depression, hypertension, low back pain. What, what do we know about comorbidities in the concept, in, in the context of patients with obesity and asthma? Well, all of these comorbidities are increased in patients who are suffering with obesity. Patients with obesity have more gastroesophageal reflux disease, they have more OSA, they have more depression. And I think all of these have the potential to interact on patients with asthma. And I'll talk about a little bit of the work that we've done. We were actually involved in a study where we did um, esophageal pH probes um, in patients with asthma, actually both adults and, and kids. Um, and we went back and we looked at that data and we looked in patients with asthma and with gastroesophageal reflux disease that were obese was there any difference in their asthma control. We looked at their lung function, we looked at their asthma control, and it looked exactly the same. Um, and, and this was with patients who don't, didn't have severe reflux, but they had mild reflux and it was certainly pH pro positive. Um, so we didn't find that that was driving their asthma, but what we did find uh, was if they had sleep apnea, um, that their asthma symptoms tended to be significantly higher. Uh, so if they had sleep apnea, their asthma control score was, um, on average, uh, 0.43 points higher. Uh, 0.5 points actually is clinically significant worsened asthma. Um, so that was concerning. And actually, for every mark of OSA they had, so if they said they snored, if they, their partner said they stopped breathing at night, for every mark you had, your asthma control score got worse by 0.23. And there have now been actually quite a few other epidemiologic studies that do suggest there is a link between asthma um, and OSA. There have been very small prospective studies looking at treating OSA and whether that can improve asthma. It does seem to. But the problem with trying to do a study like that is OSA should be treated anyway, so you can't really ethically do that, that sort of study. So what do I do with that information? If I've got a patient with poorly controlled asthma, they're suffering with obesity, I screen them for OSA, you know, verbally, and I, and I evaluate them for OSA, because it needs to be treated and it may benefit their asthma. The other thing that I think is important to know that's linked is, is, is depression, and, and there's a ton of data um, in, you know, kids and adults who suffer with the depression that they have worse asthma control. And, and there may be many reasons for this. Um, it may actually be sort of neurohormonal related. Um, it may re affect um, sort of corticosteroid responses. Uh, it may affect, you know, adherence and, and, and management. Uh, but we looked at the risk of having poor asthma control um, in patients who are obese, um, and we found that their risk of having poor asthma control was a twofold increase. We looked at patients who were depressed. Um, we found their risk of asthma control was nearly uh, 2.5 times uh, increased, and they were independent of one another. So the important thing to know here is that depression and obesity independently contribute to poor asthma control, but the problem is that patients who are obese have a much higher prevalence of depression. Um, and again, what do we do with that information? Are there prospective studies looking at treating depression? Uh, in patients with asthma, only small studies. And, and it's another thing, you know, the depression should be treated anyway. Um, so uh, I don't think those prospective studies are ever really going to get done. So back to my patient. She had gastroesophageal reflux disease. It was controlled. She had depression. For what it's worth, she was on an SSRI. Her sleep study was negative. You know, what do we think about next? Well, you know, the other thing we need to think about, uh, which we don't think about in the Pulmi community, is uh, diet. In obesity, you know, a Western society, we have different dietary intake than we did 100 years ago, right? And obesity is not so much related necessarily to increased intake, but it's related to some of the foods that have altered uh, in our diet over the last 100 years. And so there have been uh, some very interesting studies that have come out recently looking at 
sort of the Western diet. So, so looking at a diet that's high in poor quality fat, low in fiber, high in processed foods, and high in simple sugars. And, and what does this do to asthma? What does this do to respiratory symptoms? So this was a very interesting data from a colleague, uh, Emily Brigham, uh, down at Hopkins, and she published this last year. Uh, this was in a, 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 a cardiovascular uh, cohort where they had information about disease. And she looked at um, a prudent diet, and then she looked at the Western diet. And so they quantified what your diet looked like. So if you were sort of low down on, on this x-axis, in the green, you were low in a prudent diet. If you were red, you were low in the Western diet. And they looked at the risk of wheezing as the prudent diet change um, or as the Western diet got worse. What they found was that if you had higher Western intake of diet, you had more wheezing. These were patients who did not have respiratory disease. And the other thing, obviously, you're looking at cough. So were you likely to have cough? If you had a Western, Western diet, your cough increased. If you had a more prudent diet, the prevalence of cough decreased. So that this is in patients you know, who, who don't have respiratory disease. So, so quite surprising information to me it was at the time. Uh, but actually, in the asthma world, there have been some very interesting small studies, certainly, but looking at the effect of dietary factors on um, response to bronchodilator, airway inflammation, and some small studies that are being done on interventional studies looking at dietary quality. And so this is one of my favorite studies ever that was done by a woman who works out of Australia, and she looked at um, the impact of a single high-fat meal on response to albuterol, standard bronchodilator. And you know, she works in Australia, so she uses what everyone uses in Australia for a high fat meal, McDonald's. Uh, so she gave us the McDonald's, and these are the patients who got McDonald's, and these were the patients who got um, the control pill. And this is improvement in one function. And so you see that the patients who got the albuterol after the McDonald's meal had an impaired response to the bronchodilator. The other thing that she did was she did a spew on the look bits and looked at airway inflammation. And what she found was after the McDonald's meal, uh, the uh, patients with asthma had more airway inflammation, more airway neutrophilia. You know, who knew? Going to McDonald's will reduce your response to your rescue inhaler and cause increased airway inflammation. Fascinating, depressing. Um, and the other thing that she has done more recently um, is uh, given um, uh, patients with asthma, uh, made them either ingest a soluble fat fiber <coughs> sandwich, or actually the control was just eat mashed potato by itself, um, and looked at response to albuterol. So if she gave them this uh, drink that was high in soluble fiber and looked at response to bronchodilator, actually this was just improvement in lung function, the lung function improved compared to the mashed um, and airway narrowing So some data that actually ingesting um, a challenge high in soluble fiber can improve your lung function. She also uh, did another study a few years ago now where she uh, randomized patients to get either a high fruit and veg diet, and they gave them the fruit and veg, uh, versus a standard diet where they actually asked them to limit their fruit, fruit and veg intake, and she followed them to look at the risk of asthma exacerbation um, over about a 16-week period. And these were the patients with asthma that got the high fruit and veg intake, and these were the ones that they asked to limit the high the fruit and veg intake. And you can see the suggestion here was statistically significant. Those who got the high fruit and veg diet had fewer asthma exacerbation. There have been a few very small studies done here in the United States looking at improving dietary quality in asthma. And we have got very slow onto this bandwagon in, in the pulmonary world. They're much better at doing this in diabetes and, and in cardiovascular literature. And, and, uh, there was a pilot study done recently uh, published by a colleague, June Ma, who put patients with asthma on the DASH diet or the control diet. So the DASH diet is, is, is widely uh, used in uh, the, the treatment of uh, diabetes. Um, and uh, looked at uh, improvement uh, in the diet, uh, did improve the intervention looked at asthma control and then various uh, measures of asthma quality of life. And what you can see is a small pilot study, but being on the DASH diet tends to favor 
improved our quality of life and improved asthma control. Uh, she is currently working on trying to get funded um, a larger uh, study to really address this question, but at least some preliminary data that improved dietary quality does help asthma. This was in adults. And another fascinating study that was uh, published a few years ago was uh, in, in Brazil where they took um, obese adolescents um, and uh, put them either on a normal caloric diet, so they didn't ask them to lose weight, but they tried to get them on a normal caloric diet versus letting them eat you know, what they eat. And I, I gotta tell you, one of the things I've learned is you know, fast food is pervasive. And I'm sure these kids in, in Brazil were probably eating the same as, you know, our high school and middle school kids are eating here, which is not necessarily good. And so in the black is uh, sort of trying to get them on a normal caloric diet, looking at improvement in pediatric um, asthma quality of life versus leaving them on their standard, you know, high school diet. And you can see getting them on a normal caloric diet but not necessarily getting them to lose weight that enforcing a normal caloric healthy diet seems to improve pediatric quality of life. Fascinating. And so I think there's literature coming out which, which, which should be encouraging. Losing weight is in incredibly hard to do. But I think what, what I'm trying to do with, with some of my patients is to at least try and get them to sort of focus on, on, on dietary qualities. I think there's increasing data coming out that if we can try and improve dietary quality over and above the other beneficial effects on health, um, I think there's going to be a beneficial effect on asthma control. So what, what do we know about weight loss? There have been a few small studies. Oh, before I get to that, I just want to, sorry, I forgot I had this slide in here. This is, this is also very interesting. This, this is a diet in the pathogenesis of asthma. So, so this, this is a... Uh, a whole new area that's been opening up recently, looking at uh, sort of the risk of uh, diet in the development of asthma. And so uh, this was a study I'm very fond of where they, uh, they did it in mice, and they put mice either on a low-fiber diet or a high-fiber diet um, and uh, challenged them with um, a house dust mice, which is one of our standard ways in the lab of, of treating asthma. What I hope you can see this Control diet versus the low fiber diet, there's more black, more, more red here, there's more inflammation in the airway. The control diet versus the high fiber diet, you can see the mice who were kept on the high fiber diet had less airway inflammation. And so, what links fiber and airway inflammation? I, I, I talked about that sort of a little earlier, but um, I, th I think this, di this study in mice really helps us. Well, actually, the fiber alters the gut microbiome. The fiber alters bacteria in the gut. So this was looking at populations of bacteria uh, on a control diet. And you can see a lot of different colors, which means a lot of different uh, bacterial species. The low fiber diet was an overflow of bacteroidity. This is the control diet in a slightly different um, high fiber diet. And you can see that the high fiber diet, again, good um, sort of biodiversity in the high fiber diet. And what they found was the high fiber diet changed the bacteria in the gut such that they produce this metabolite, uh, propionate, which gets absorbed and can affect immune cell function. And it affected the immune cell function to decrease allergic airway inflammation. So the fiber in the diet affects immune cells because of the metabolites that it releases and can suppress allergic airway inflammation. I think this is, you know, this was new onset development of asthma and there's also epidemiologic data that now is coming out looking at maternal diets um, and risk of asthma in the offspring. The maternal diet is likely very important in the risk of asthma in the offspring. I'm saying lots of things to make the poor moms feel guilty. I don't mean to do that. So, so j just, just to reiterate, this low-fiber diet uh, seems to increase your risk of developing asthma, and it's not through a direct effect on the airway. It's through an effect on the gut microbiome, and I think this really needs to sort of change the way that we're thinking about asthma. Um, and, you know, it's a systemic disease, and we need to be thinking about diet. So I've talked a lot about diet, but, but, but what about weight loss, you know? Weight loss, tough to do. Can we achieve it? Well, 
There have been some small studies that suggest yes. Um, this was a study, um, actually, also actually, Bill, they've done a lot of work on asthma and obesity, um, looking at improvement in asthma control um, before and after a weight loss intervention. This was just weight loss. This was uh, uh, a dietary intervention plus exercise. And exercise seemed to have a beneficial effect. So the patients who got the dietary intervention plus the exercise seemed to do better than just the patients who got the weight loss intervention. So having said that, the ones who lost, who did exercise, exercised more, lost more weight as well. And so a number of studies have suggested this. And what I tell my patients, um, is about they need to lose about five percent of their body weight to improve asthma control, and exercise appears to be beneficial. I will tell you we are currently studying a weight loss intervention right now, um, and one of the things that the uh, nutritionist who's working with me has said it's really really hard um, to get your patients with asthma to exercise because you know what when they try and exercise and they walk they get hardly short of breath because of the asthma and because um, sort of, of the weight. Um, so I think a lot of our patients with severe asthma who are overweight have just got into this vicious cycle where it's really, really hard for them to get moving. Um, and I gotta tell you, my patient was not gonna lose weight, and one of the reasons she wasn't losing weight was she was almost continually on prednisone, and she couldn't exercise because she couldn't breathe. And actually, um, she was participating in a research study, and we, d we did a research study looking at uh, the efficacy of bariatric surgery in patients with asthma. And we followed about 25 patients, and the BMI went from on average 51 to 38. The asthma control score was 1.5 and above poorly controlled asthma, and scored 0.75 and below well controlled asthma. On average, they went from well controlled from poorly controlled to well controlled. They lost a lot of weight, their asthma control improved significantly, and their lung function improved significantly as well. So they did a lot better with bariatric surgery. There have now been a number of other studies which suggest the same thing. And a very interesting um, epidemiologic study published by the Channing School of Public Health a few years ago, where they looked at uh, patients um, going through bariatric surgery and they looked at with, with asthma, and they looked at the risk of an asthma exacerbation in the two years prior to bariatric surgery and the two years after bariatric surgery. And you can see that um, there are rate of asthma exacerbation is about half. Um, so very, very interesting data which suggests that bariatric surgery may actually reduce asthma exacerbation. Uh, bariatric surgery is not an easy thing to do in a patient with severe asthma, though, so this is um, not going to be the panacea. Um, so what do we need to know about obesity and asthma? Well, these patients have increased severe asthma, and obesity is now a major risk factor for asthma in this country. I didn't discuss it, but um, it's thought to explain about 250,000 new cases of asthma per year in the United States. This is uh, in adults, it's in adults and children, it's in all ethnic groups, and I've seen reports from all over the world of this. It, it really is changing the epidemiology of disease. I think we need to think about uh, managing these patients quite differently than, than, than lean patients with asthma. Uh, the response to medications is altered, um, and we need to be cognizant of that as physicians. Um, I think we need to understand that they're more susceptible to environmental factors. And so, you know, burning wood smoke in my, my patient was, was not optimal, but that's not always necessarily easy to intervene with in Vermont. Um, susceptibility to infection, increased risk of developing uh, influenza, um, and actually then Surratt at our own place has looked at worse outcomes related to different bacterial infections. Um, I don't know how to intervene with that right now. Um, I, I, try to be conscious, really conscious to get patients who are suffering with both obesity and asthma to get them vaccinated, but also warn them, you know, if there's, there's a flu outbreak, you really need to be washing your hands and, and not go around someone with the flu. Um, think, we have to think about comorbidities, particularly obstructive uh, sleep apnea and depression. I think they're important. 
and really the, 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 the new paradigm shift, you know, for me, and for, I, was, I was talking earlier, for, for a lot of uh, pulmonologists and asthma dogs is, is thinking much harder about lifestyle considerations um, and emphasizing dietary quality. You know, weight loss, yes, great if you can achieve it, but really, really hard to achieve. So if you can't lose weight, you know, focusing on at least improving dietary quality might be uh, a good place to go. Um, certainly encouraging exercise, but also being aware that many of these patients have a lot of difficulty with exercising. Um, I do think there is a role for bariatric surgery. It can be effective, um, but it's not somewhat, somewhere I go immediately if certainly patients who can't breathe are uh, at increased risk of complications with major surgery. Um, and so those are my main take-home points. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. colleagues um, up at UVM who've been looking at the effects of um, dietary quality um, on scores of anxiety and depression and doing functional MRI measurements, um, and it changes signaling um, in, in the brain. Um, and I think we underestimate the effects that poor dietary quality can have on depression, anxiety, and, 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 and sense of well-being. Um, and I think there's also what, what I what 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 I hear is sort of this sense of learned helplessness as well, almost. It, and these poor quality foods, that are, you know, also we talked about this a little earlier. That they're, they're the least expensive foods as well. Um, and so you know, people start eating them. They feel rotten, but they're the only foods that they can afford. And they're also very addictive and, 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 and reinforcing, and people just get into this vicious cycle. And I, you know, I, I think you know we need to change our, our whole going big here. Is, you know, not a democratic presidential candidate, but but you know we need to change our whole approach to sort of you know the food industry here because I think we're subsidizing the wrong things, and it's taking a huge toll on it, on our population. And it's not just asthma, it's not just heart disease, it's not just diabetes, but, but I think it's also, you know, behavior and, you know, psychologic and psychiatric disease, to be honest with you. And then just a comment, if I can make a comment, you were mentioning some research in Brazil and talking about sort of the, the fast food piece. Yeah. Uh, I lived in Brazil um, oh. in, in, uh, quite some time ago, probably like, 10 years ago. Yeah. Track. Um, but the, even then, the exportation of the fast food industry globally is a real thing. And one of the sort of most shocking moments of my time there was I had the opportunity to visit um, the Bocinha, which is one of the most famous favelas um, in, right, right in Rio. Um, and for those not familiar with the favela, it's, um, it's basically it's somewhat like a shanty town where um, workers you know, came to uh, 
high income areas to sort of help build buildings or whatever, and then to sort of build up these communities, sometimes on the, often on the side of a hill. But, you know, there's no codes, they're just building, they're, they're taking electricity from the electrical system. They're very, very dangerous um, places. And where, when you hear about all the um, sort of the drugs, the, the organized crime, um, it's often based at these communities. And so I had the opportunity to, to visit, because uh, it's not a place you can just kind of go on your own uh, often. And uh, so I was having this tour, and they have, you know, homes and shops in, in the middle of the Hosea with a little McDonald's. Oh, goodness. And I, yeah. I couldn't yeah. believe it. Wow. I was like, wow, McDonald's really is everywhere. Yeah, that's really shocking. Yeah, thank you. Goodness. Yeah. I just had a quick question yeah. about the, the diet comparison. One of the uh, comparison diets was the prudent diet. I would have to go back to the paper to look at it specifically, but it was considered to be um, a healthy diet. Um, so high in fruit and vegetables, um, low in red meat, high in fish, um, and high in um, sort of healthier oils. Um, it's it's sort of this validated score that that they that they use. Oh, thanks, thanks. Um, and my other comment was I read a study recently about the difference between plant fiber from plants versus like that amusable or like a soluble fiber that's been processed, and there's a huge difference in the gut microbiome. So yeah. I'd be curious to hear if that study was replicated with just plant plant sources versus a soluble fiber, how that would impact. I don't. I don't think we know. I, I, I think we're sort of the, in the infancy of, of doing these studies, and I, I think you're asking, you know, very important questions. And, and you know, from, from a philosophical point of view, you know, as, as I say, I think we're very slow to come to this, you know, in 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 in, in the pulmonary community. And I know, you know, as, as you know, we're, we're putting in these, these grant applications. You know, you're, you're seeing sort of, you know. The mechanistic study in mice, you know, they're excited about those, but they're not necessarily wanting to do studies of diet in humans. And you're like, oh my goodness, you, you, you know, it, it it doesn't seem glamorous, um, but it's so important. Um, so watch this space, you know. I'm, I'm I'm hoping to be able to answer those questions eventually. Thank you. Yeah. Um, regarding this, um, the whole micro um, gut micro. I don't know the language, yeah. biological. Yeah. Um, there was a news report this last week. Um, I didn't look at the, the research yet, um, but it was getting at the um, similar notion, but with respect to the behavioral elements of wanting to exercise. So that the link between that, um, that environment in the gut um, being a predisposing individuals to move versus be sedentary. Oh, isn't that amazing? And so it, it makes me think about this whole issue of asthma, obesity, yeah. as more of an allergic reaction or a, um, a metabolic functioning versus right. any of these the symptoms of uh, obesity is a symptom of that or yeah. asthma is a symptom of, of that. Um, yeah. Well, I, you, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I think you know, we, as a pulmonologist, you know, I, I, I focus on the lungs. Um, and in asthma, you know, that, that's a pulmonary disease, right? But, but you know what? The, the lungs don't exist by themselves. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, maybe asthma is sort of a response to, you know, various toxicities in our environment. And it's not just the inhaled toxicities. That's the thing I've become to understand. It's sort of, you know, the ingested toxicities as well. Um, and I, I, I think we need to be thinking of it more as a systemic disease. residents go to up to date, right? That's where they got all their medical information. So we we just got a chapter into up to date, so now this is an official problem. <laughs> you know, that the residents and med students will, 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 will believe in. I mean I think it's gonna um, take a lot of work. And I, I tell you physicians are afraid 
of things that require behavioral and lifestyle interventions. As a physician, it's much easier for me to write a prescription than it is for me to sort of, you know, sit down and talk about um, lifestyle changes and behavioral interventions. Um, you know, as a pulmonologist, we can just about do tobacco cessation, but even that we don't really like, but we know we have to do. And tr trying to get people on board with it, with this lifestyle intervention and understanding um, that it's, it's going to take a lot of education and a lot of work. I, I hear you. I, I, I feel like, you know, people think I'm sort of this, you know, fringe interest, but, but they're, you know, beginning to hear the message and there's more and more people sort of working in this area now. I mean, because the epidemiology speaks for itself. Well, you know, we think of ourselves as, as not being a particularly obese state, but I, but I got to tell you, every state in, in Chittenden County, um, the, the the prevalence is not very high. But I got to tell you, the prevalence of obesity in Vermont has just increased dramatically as well, a, a, along with the rest. Um, you know, what other factors could be playing into it? You, you know, I, I worry about diet as well. You know, we think ourselves as a sort of farm to table, and I think those of us who are relatively affluent, you know, we do like to sort of, you know eat healthy quality foods. I'm not sure that everybody in the state has access to, you know, good healthy quality foods. Um, and then I wonder about sort of the effects of indoor air pollution, particularly through the winter. You know, what toll is that taking on, on, on our population? And along the lines of curious about the impact of smoke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I do wonder about that because that data that I showed from the kids in Baltimore it was particularly PM 2.5 that 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 they were looking at. Um, so so I I do wonder about that. And and then I bet you it's not just sort of you know the wood smoke. You know, it's the forced air heat. And, and you know how is is that you know really really clean? You know, and then our schools. You know, our schools aren't necessarily built with clean air in mind. Um, and so we're exposing all our kids. I think you know to dreadful air quality and we're shutting them up in it for, you know, six, eight months. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. In a uh, previous uh, uh, talk you gave, you talked about inulin uh, and getting at uh, Lucy's question about, you know, the, the fiber. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is there a difference, you think, in like, you know, I know that people uh, have a kind of are um, avoiding weed and other kinds of things, but there's a lot of wheat fiber, yeah. and there was, you, you discussed inulin and its role in a study, but is, and there's still, it was the various kinds of corn and that. Yeah, yeah, um, I, 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 I wish we knew, I, I, I wish we knew, I think there's so much work that, that we need to do um, in this field, I mean, I don't know, yeah. I wish I did. And you want to ask if there's any questions on the phone? Yeah, yeah. Does, does anyone on the phone have any questions? In the pulmonary community, no. <laughs> it is in the primary care community, and not a board. But yeah, no, no. Yeah. And, and, and in the pulmonary community, we don't even begin to think about it. I'm sorry. It's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. It does seem to have some, certainly some promise. Yeah. And yeah. helping to support this activity that doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Help your food that is yeah. low to no cost. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we need to rethink our approach here in a fundamental yeah. way. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you're interested in certainly looking at Ann Dixon's website, or, um, 
uh, faculty page at the University of Vermont. I found that very interesting. You're in a funding and history there if you want to find out more. Um, for physical activity and nutrition, um, the PAM program at the health department has more information and certainly the ASMA program as well. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking. Thank you for a great talk.